Thanks, Damien, and thanks to all of you for inviting me here to speak. I'm Robert Jones, Global Lead for Aquaculture at the Nature Conservancy, and it's been a pleasure learning a little bit about CNET today. I think CNET's actually really a bright spot for U.S. aquaculture uh, overall and is a potentially a replicable model. So I think you all have really a lot to be proud about, and uh, I'm looking forward to the tour uh, later this afternoon. So I think for years there's been a persistent narrative around aquaculture, that we can either protect the environment or uh, we can allow aquaculture to grow. And I think this has been persistent, particularly in the conservation community and in the general public. Uh, I think we need to work together on a new paradigm, a new narrative around aquaculture in which the environment is well protected, but aquaculture can flourish. The reality is we need both, we need to do both. Uh, our planet has never been under more peril. Uh, you've seen the UN report that came out two weeks ago that said over a million species are now at risk of extinction. We need to uh, protect the last great places on our planet, and we need to do that urgently. At the same time, however, we need to figure out a way to feed 9 billion people on our planet by the year 2050, and to do that the most sustainable way possible. And I think aquaculture plays a big role in that, if it's done well. So let's step back for a second. What the heck is, is the Nature Conservancy doing working on aquaculture? You guys are a land trust, right? Well, we are. Uh, we're the largest private landowner in the United States. Uh, we work, uh, we have 3,500 employees, 600 of which are scientists. We are working in 72 countries around the world. Uh, and in, in spite of being the world's largest conservation organization, we've realized that we simply cannot uh, make and address the big challenges facing nature and people by purchasing land alone. It just, it doesn't work at scale. So we spent the last three years, uh, or more actually, looking at what our new priority should be overall. And what we've decided is we really need to be addressing uh, the underlying issues facing people on our planet. We came up with four priorities, um, and these are them. Protecting land and water, tackling climate change, providing food and water sustainably, and building healthy cities. This is what the Nature Conservancy does now. And this food priority is where I come in with the aquaculture program, and that's why I have a job. That's why they hired me three years ago to start this program. Um, so today what I wanted to do is to talk to you a little bit about our global strategic analysis, which has really informed the direction that we're taking with aquaculture and a bit of our perspective there. I'm gonna highlight a couple of our key uh, initiatives and I'm not gonna get to them all, but I think um, I'll touch on the most important ones and I'm gonna leave a little time for Q and A, I hope, before we can uh, allow for that. Well. I've spent a fair amount of time in Asia over the past couple of years. I've been in China, actually, twice in the last year. And there's no doubt that there are some places on Earth where aquaculture's rapid development has come at the expense of the environment. And we should keep that in mind and recognize that there are real problems. This is in China, in southern China. I actually took this picture. I wish I was uh, on top of that cliff right there and took this because you could you would be able to see the miles and miles of expanses of farms here just really unplanned development lots of coastal net pen aquaculture here in the marine environment shrimp shrimp ponds and a number of other types of aquaculture all in this area and it's been you know quite unplanned um, so this is a challenge but I also think there's other places in the world that aquaculture is not developing and this is also posing a challenge for nature and people. Aquaculture is just really falling short of its potential. Why is that a problem from an environmental perspective? Well, if we look at the global trends that are out there, I think we're recognizing at TNC and the other big NGOs such as WWF and CI are recognizing that aquaculture is actually one of the most resource and efficient means of producing animal protein that we have, maybe aside from insects and that the resources needed to produce food on land are becoming constrained, uh, particularly as we're looking at things as soil health degradation and um, you know, the lack of air, the decrease in available arable land that's occurring today and the added stressors of climate change, which is making food production even more challenging. A lot of you guys know this already, 
but I think this is, underpins the entire argument of why we think aquaculture is important at TNC. Look at the environmental performance trade-offs of, of other types of animal agriculture production versus aquaculture production. And three key areas here, greenhouse gas emissions, land use, and freshwater use. I, am, I mean, this is remarkable. And if you think about uh, shellfish and seaweed aquaculture, it's way more efficient than that. I mean, these are really nature's kind of superheroes in terms of resource utilization. Also, you know, we recognize that we can't rely upon the wild as our sole source of uh, seafood, seafood production. So this is, this is uh, aquaculture is important going forward, but wild fisheries are always also going to be very important. Uh, we do think there is hope when we look around the world. There are some countries that are employing innovative and responsible ways of producing seafood already. But I think the share of countries that are doing so is relatively small. What we did here, this is kind of maybe a bit reductionist, but it, may, it can help think through uh, some of the strategy that we've looked at in developing our aquaculture work. So we plotted tw the top 50 producers of aquaculture by value against regulatory quality. Uh, regulatory quality being a proxy for environmental protection. Good regulatory quality, higher levels of environmental protection. We really want to see what we think the ultimate goal here is really high levels of aquaculture production met with high levels of environmental protection. Our goal is really this top white quadrant. There's a couple of countries that are up there in that category. There's another group of countries that you might say have environmental challenges that have high levels of aquaculture production but met with lower levels of environmental quality. There's another group of countries that probably are constrained from a regulatory perspective. And then there's some that are maybe just uninvestable. I don't know, I don't think North Korea is gonna be a place that we're gonna be working anytime soon. <laughs> um, so this is really a conceptual model in the way of thinking about the world of aquaculture. For conservation objectives for our program, we can kind of break these quadrants down into places that we are working on what we would like to achieve. We want to really learn the best practice and technologies from these smart growth countries and what's going on there. Uh, we want to be working towards environmental safeguards in this other set of countries and working towards smart uh, growth opportunities in another set. And the way to get there, we think, is improving governance and improving capital deployment to those locations. We can't work as TNC in every country around the world. We really need to be focusing on countries that have the enabling conditions for smart growth, and that's not all of them. We need to work on places where there's a baseline of uh, environmental protection and regulatory uh, basis, as well as you don't want to be starting necessarily from a green field in terms of aquaculture production either. Um, here's a generalized theory of a change. Really, this can apply to just about uh, any sustainable development program. But our objective here is to work on governance improvements where we're uh, building tools for coastal managers and developing capacity building programs and pairing that with initiatives to increase capital investment into the, be the best and most sustainable production systems through our partnerships. And the idea is that governance improvement program can enable increased investment into the sector, which would reinforce the profitability of these sustainable systems, would reinforce a governance structure. And that's, I think that's how we ultimately can win um, and get smart growth, which benefits both people and our planet. So what are we doing in this govern governance improvements area? Uh, this is data from a UN survey. Uh, countries around the world are asked to self-report every other year on what are the biggest challenges facing, regulation, facing them as they regulate their industry. And year after year, countries around the world s seem to report the lowest numbers around aqu aquaculture zoning and area management. So this is a one through five scale, five meaning there's a complete uh, ground level enforcement of that measure, and zero means there's absolute lack of a measure. There's probably some politicking going on here. I don't think countries are going to answer zero very often or five either, but it keeps coming up that zoning and area management is at the top of the list. 
Well, we said, okay, this is actually really, really interesting for us in terms of identifying the global challenge. We really think that aquaculture siting, area management, and spatial planning is one of the highest ecological returns on investment that we can be spending our time. Where we put new farms as they come in, aquaculture as a growth area can really determine the environmental impact of those uh -oh, operations. Uh, getting farms away from critical habitats, siting in places where effluent is impacts are less. In the cases of seaweed and shellfish farming, farming in certain areas could actually have a positive benefit on marine environments. So the siting question for us and area management approaches are absolutely critical. So this is an area we wanted to prioritize going forward when looking at our global program. So we started to outline our approach here, uh, how we're going to go about doing this. Our approach has been to partner with global institutions and experts in aquaculture management uh, and to build some internal capacity at TNC. We're new at, we're new at this. We've identified countries that want and need the assistance in this area, and then we are providing siting and spatial planning support and building in-country capacity through um, training programs to build long-term sustainability. So the one of the first partnerships we built was with NOAA, National Ocean Service, uh, Dr. James Morris's lab down in Beaufort, North Carolina, who's got a pretty great program on spatial planning and siting. Uh, we developed a joint fellowship pro program with uh, James's office, and we could learn a bit about how NOAA is doing coastal siting and spatial planning for aquaculture. Uh, we were able to, through the joint fellow, work on uh, some of the NOAA regional aquaculture spatial planning efforts in Southern California, uh, which uh, it was a pretty extensive effort, and a new product that NOS just came out with, uh, which is kind of a next generation st strategic uh, spatial planning model on marinecadaster.gov, the ocean reporting tool, which is actually really cool if you haven't checked it out. So now we're in a phase of trying to apply these same techniques to other countries. One place we're doing this is in Micronesia, in the country of Palau, and we have a pretty extensive um, effort there going on to develop rabbit fish aquaculture. Palau is in a really interesting situation. Uh, climate change is moving fish stocks farther away. Overfishing is impacting the area. Uh, we've got um, a place that has one of the highest levels of non-communicable diseases in the world as folks are getting less seafood in their diets and eating increasing levels of processed food from the United States. So this is an environmental, there's an environmental challenge and there's a social challenge. We're working hand in hand with the government to develop the rabbit fish aquaculture. But one of the big challenges that we have and see here going forward is the sighting question. Oh, one more thing about the rabbit fish. It's the preferred species that they like to eat uh, there locally in Palau. So it's a really locally designed for improving nutrition in country. But the siting question is really important in Palau. We've realized that some of the early sites that have been developed there may not have been the most sustainable. So we've been working on the siting question um, with in, in partnership with NASA to identify appropriate aquaculture development zones and locations within Palau. Um, we're at an early stage of that. Uh, we had uh, our first project kickoff meeting uh, in Karor in 2019, we're bringing together a broad group of stakeholders. This is as much a scientific process as it is a stakeholder engagement process. Uh, and we've got the, the fishermen there alongside the Environmental Quality Protection Board, uh, alongside the Bureau of Marine Resources. We're all working together on this. So the fishermen and see the value, uh, the fishermen that are piloting the aquaculture see the value in this as well, because they haven't been able to undertake uh, extensive and necessary environmental assessments in order to get permitted. So they see this as being in the interest of their, their business and their, as well. Um, another place that we're doing this uh, work is part in our field program in Belize. We have an eff effort around developing sustainable seaweed aquaculture with fishing communities there as well. Um, seaweed is really new to um, uh, development in Belize. Uh, we think it has a lot of potential. It can be done very sustainably. It, seaweed has a really high price in uh, Belize, so it's a great place to be working on this. I am not, so spatial tools are part of it. Finding appropriate sites has been uh, one part of the initiative, but I'm going to let 
uh, my colleague Julie Robinson, who leads the Belize program, talk about this through a video, because I think she does a better job than I do. All right. Well, I should say that Julie, my colleague who's in that video, she will be a new master's student at UNE in the Ocean Food Systems Program next year, so you might be seeing more of her in Maine. Um, so we're happy about that. Um, so uh, I talked about some of the governance, governance improvements work that we're trying to get done. This other piece around increasing capital to better types of production systems around the world, what are we doing there? Well. Uh, Two weeks ago, we just released a new report called Towards a Blue Revolution, Catalyzing Private Investment into Sustainable Aquaculture Production Systems. We just wrote this collaboratively with the private sector partner called Encourage Capital, which is an impact investment firm uh, based out of New York. Um, why did we do it? Well, I think capital has been traditionally constrained entering in some of the more innovative in production systems and aquaculture for a number of different reasons. One might may be an outsized risk return ratio. Basically, investors think it's too risky relative to the return to get involved with aquaculture. We think that might the perceived risk might actually be higher than the real risk. There's also some real I would say confusion among impact-oriented interested investors of whether they should be even involved in aquaculture, and if so, which types and which sectors. So we wanted to clarify that. And just overall, there's a dearth of uh, studies that have been written for an investor community on aquaculture. It's a really expansive report. Um, I'd encourage you to check it out sometime when you have time. It's written for an investor audience, but it break it looks at the aquaculture sector and new innovations in this area, both through a financial lens as well as a sustainability lens. Um, and it it's, might be a useful reference to you as you uh, uh, move on in your endeavors in aquaculture. What do we look at in the report? I'm just going to talk about a few of the things that we highlighted. We looked at areas of intersection which we believe meet the, the uh, opportunity for sustainability on aquaculture as well as profitability. So we looked at novel fin fish aquaculture production systems, both recirculating systems and offshore systems, and we looked at bivalve and seaweed systems. Um, RAS, we looked at recirculating aquaculture, certainly a hot topic here in Maine. Um, there's a lot to like about RAS, you know, moving farms onto land can help um, remove farms from the physical environment. Uh, and reduce potential genetic impacts and the filtration of the waste uh, when it's done well and responsibly can reduce these water pollution impacts. Of course, it's not a silver bullet. Um, you have to think about the energy increases potentially could be mitigated by moving closer to uh, end markets and using renewable sources of energy, but we're excited about it and we're excited about these new opportunities in RAS. We identified a huge pipeline of new RAS projects, mostly in the United States and uh, in Europe. Uh, very significant pipeline of projects here that have been developed. Um, but one observation is that currently RAS volumes are still having a limited impact on total fish supply globally. They're a small percentage of population. Uh, some of the new announcements by groups like Atlantic Sapphire and others, maybe that changes going forward and it can become uh, really significant, uh, reach a significant scale. But at least it doesn't also utilize an underutilized area for food production, which is our open ocean, which currently only accounts for only 2% of human food. So we do think offshore aquaculture systems can be part of the solution here. Again, it's not a silver bullet, but in some ways, this can reduce some of the impacts of aquaculture uh, compared to the status quo or traditional aquaculture that's practiced around the world. If you haven't looked at some of the studies that have come out recently, particularly the one by Aaron, Aaron Welsh et al. that looked at uh, nutrient and water quality impacts of offshore farms, they're pretty uh, impressive. There's actually not a lot uh, to show in terms of impacts at least beyond 90 meters from the farm. Haley Froelich at UCSB, which is a postdoc that we sponsored, she's done some research on that as well, bringing together information on this. So we think it's encouraging. There's lots of examples of different types of cages and farming equipment offshore that we were able to look at in the study. And we really identified two kind of categories, offshore fin fish 
of offshore finfish farms, an independent group of offshore farms mostly based in Latin America that have smaller uh, production uh, at, at current stage, and then a group of uh, offshore developing developers from uh, Norway and the Norwegian salmon industry, a bunch of publicly traded companies there. So there's investment opportunities on both the pu private side and the public side. It's one thing that these systems can be more sustainable, but can they also be more profitable? Or, or, or uh, yeah, and I think the, the tide is turning on that. So one of the things that we wanted to point out in this report is the tide is changing. That's making these new, innovative, more sustainable production systems more profitable. Seafood demand is increasing and conventional supply is constrained. Uh, the, most salmon producing countries aren't readily issu issuing more leases. Um, even places like China are moving away from aquaculture in the coastal zone. Uh, technology improvements are now decreasing the relative costs of these production systems relative to other systems. And increasing, uh, there's potentially some increase in traditional production costs due to increased regulation of traditional systems like coastal net pens. So these combined forces really, I think, lead us from a business as usual scenario with aquaculture to a potentially more investable, uh, an investable solution which is more sustainable, making RAS and offshore more profitable. Uh, the last area that we identified in the report was restorative aquaculture that we analyzed, or bivalve and seaweed aquaculture. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of our work in this area. From a business standpoint, we think there's you know great opportunity for this to expand both to new species and with existing species and new areas and to new product types. Uh, you know, we're very excited about the seaweed stuff that's going on here in Maine and other places. Um, but from an ecological standpoint, you know we think. Uh, this is this is great. It might be one of the most sustainable ways of producing food that we have when best management practices are implemented. Um, in terms of ecosystem service provision, the nutrient mitigation potential uh, is there and has been well demonstrated in a lot of places. The habitat provision of these farms providing habitat for fish stocks that may be overexploited. Um, and some of the research around local climate change, potential mitigation, um, at least in a localized sense for seaweed, is really interesting as well. We've invested a lot at TNC in the science behind the ecosystem services of aquaculture over the last several years. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we came out with a report or a public peer-reviewed publication in biosciences documenting the ecosystem services of aquaculture. So a synthesis science paper explaining what the ecosystem services are and identifying the conditions that influence delivery of ecosystem services. There was a follow-on paper that we did um, in reviews in aquaculture where we uh, reviewed 129 papers and pulled together some conclusions around that. A new paper that we have that's under review, uh, currently in scientific reports, is an analysis of where shellfish and seaweed aquaculture around the world could potentially provide the greatest benefit to both people and nature in terms of restorative potential benefits. The idea here is like, if we can direct shellfish and seaweed aquaculture more deliberately towards ecosystem service provision, this could be a market-based solution for ecosystem recovery, which I think is an interesting idea. So, you know, this is a, a map of around the world where the solutions that we came up with, um, and you'll see that the Northeast of the United States comes up pretty high, both for shellfish and seaweed aquaculture. Um, our field programs in the US, and I'm gonna touch on this a little bit because I know a lot of folks are working on bivalves and seaweed here. Um, we have, uh, a number of field programs in the United States that are working on aquaculture. And most of them are working on this ecosystem service assessment together with academic and industry partners. In the Chesapeake Bay, we're working on assessing the water quality benefits of Chesapeake Bay's oyster farms, working with four producers up and down the Chesapeake Bay in collaboration with VIMS. <coughs> Out in California, um, we're working with Hog Island Oyster Company in University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, we're using drones to monitor eelgrass and uh, shellfish aquaculture interactions and trying to build a long-term data set to make conclusions or draw inferences around well, what the impacts shellfish aquaculture is having on those eelgrass communities. Eelgrass are super important to us, 
Um, we want to make sure the farms aren't having a negative impact. But we've had a lot of farmers tell us, including here at Hog Island, that the shellfish farms uh, are being encroached by eelgrass, and they think there's a positive ecosystem service delivery that's occurring there. So we're excited about this research uh, and the results that may come out of it. Uh, the idea is to develop a drone monitoring protocol that farmers can use and is accepted by regulators. And traditionally, it's been pretty expensive to do this ecological monitoring of farms. Uh, and this is a lower cost method in doing so. Um, in Washington State, in collaboration with NOAA Fisheries and Taylor Shellfish Farms and Jamestown Squalm Tribe, we're looking at the habitat utilization of shellfish aquaculture gear in Washington State. Uh, this is an area I think that has been less well studied in terms of ecosystem services, so we're investing in that and we're using the GoPros um, to be able to identify fish species around the farms. And we are also, uh, beginning this year, working in Massachusetts in collaboration with NOAA and Island Creek Oyster Co Company on doing a sim and Northeastern University on a similar study um, here in the Northeast. Uh, where the gear types and species are, are different. Um, so we wanted to replicate a, a similar study. Um, overall, uh, I touched on some of our programs, but not all of them. In case you're interested, the current places we're working are the United States, Belize, Indonesia, Palau, Hong Kong, and China. And we're adding some new programs in next fiscal year uh, that'll be working on uh, aquaculture in New Zealand, FSM, and Tanzania. <coughs> Um, finally, you know, and we can go to questions in a second. I, I started by talking about the need to advance a new paradigm for aquaculture. And here's another paradigm, and I think this is what I would love to see us working on together and talking about when we talk about aquaculture. I really think that aquaculture, when it's done well, can help us address some of the greatest challenges facing our planet. This is a list of SDG goals. Um, at UN Sustainable Development Goals. And look, there's a really strong correlation between aquaculture and many of these things. So I think we are working on solving these problems. And I think it's up to you, especially the students in the next generation of aquaculturists, to have this be the narrative for aquaculture. So thanks very much, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>